Final presentation evolving specifications for, mod mo for modern concrete will be given by Michael Prawl. Michael is a senior concrete engineer in the Federal Highway Administration's Office of Pre-Construction, Construction, Construction <clears throat> and Pavements, where he leads a variety of FHWA initiatives in the areas of concrete materials, concrete construction, and quality assurance, including the FHWA's efforts to implement performance specifications for concrete. Additionally, Mr. Prawl manages the FHWA Mobile Concrete Technology Center program, which works to implement new concrete technologies throughout the country. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from Clarkson, a Master's in Civil Engineering from Rensselaer, and is a licensed professional engineer in the state of Maine. He has two grown daughters and lives in Augusta with his wife, Jody. Michael. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Bill. Go Clarkson. All right, now I appreciate the invitation to come here today. Uh, I saw a few friendly faces in the audience today. And, uh, for I've been the senior concrete engineer with FHWA for the last eight years or so. For 20 plus before that, I was our lead engineer in our division office here in Maine. Uh, so again, the opportunity to come here uh, and speak, I appreciate it very much. And it's also nice to be back on campus when I'm not having to pay for my younger daughter's degree anymore. So how many people have seen this vehicle or are aware that it exists? Quick show of hands. Few of you? Okay, this is our Mobile Concrete Technology Center. And uh, what we do with this, the U.S. is the only government in the world that promotes technology implementation with this kind of program. And what this is, we, sp we put $2 million a year into this program. Uh, I have five guys that, that work for me on this, three concrete engineers and two technicians that have CDLs. And we coordinate with state DOTs, and at state DOT request, we coordinate with their contractor, and we take this high-tech concrete lab to a site, an actual construction site. We set up for two weeks and we test fresh and hardened concrete properties and to demonstrate new technologies side by side with the existing technologies to show both the state and industry what the advantages are of the new technologies. Because I can go tell a state DOT, you know, I can tell Joyce Taylor, you know, here's this great new piece of concrete equipment. You know, is she going to go spend 10 grand to buy it and give it a try? Probably not. But if I can show her how good it works on her concrete, then we've got a chance for implementation. So that's what the program's all about. And I tell you that because I, I'm going to just touch on some concrete technologies, but then uh, most of my talk is going to be about specifications. And a lot of the data that I'm going to show you comes from this. So this is real world data. I didn't make this up for example purposes because we are in addition to moving technology forward, you know, with some of the tools that I'll briefly touch on, we really need to take this opportunity as we are getting ready to move into a low carbon future of looking at our existing concrete specifications because we have done a horrible job. And when I say we, I mean anybody and everybody who has anything to do with concrete. We have done a horrible job at keeping our specifications and standards in line with our materials, practices, and technology. And hopefully 15 minutes from now, you will all agree with me. And there's what my lawyers want me to tell you. So. There's what the program's all about. And I think the, uh, the schematic really captures it best. We're not a research program. We work very closely with the research community. You know, and one of our responsibilities is to identify practitioner ready tools that have come from the research community. Everything on our trailer is practitioner ready. Again, we are not a research program. You know, we are strictly, we work with practitioners, again, primarily the states and industry. Uh, I'm not going to read all the bullets to you, but I really I want to touch on that last one, the better concrete, because the industry, a lot of times, and particularly if they're not familiar with us, industry can be a little bit reluctant to engage with us. You know, we're, we are the federal government. The trailer comes from Washington, D.C. You know, not everybody is dying to have us crawl around their project for two weeks. Uh, but what I tell them is, you know, most of the federal highway programs, right, we deal very closely with the state DOTs. But our program doesn't, and our program is free of any and all regulations. So there are no mandates that come with our program. We have one obligation with our trailer program, and that is to do what we have to do to get better concrete on the infrastructure. So again, we work very closely to do this, and I tell the industry, we're not pro-agency, and, and we're not pro-industry, we are pro-concrete. Right, we have a lot of support. Uh, when our trailers are not out, and we have an asphalt trailer as well, fortunately, I do not manage that one, uh, but that one runs around the country just like our concrete trailer. When they're not out and about, they sit at our Turner Fairbank Research Center outside of D.C., and I, I threw this slide in to show you we do have the highest level of support. Secretary Pete came to see us last October. He'd heard about these trailers, and he's really into pavements. 
And he told us a story. He got real into pavements, listening to people complain at him when he was getting his groceries in South Bend. He said, when you're the mayor of a town, you hear all about potholes and you learn all about pavements. And he really is, is a pretty bright guy. But we had a lot of support. Just briefly to touch on these, because again, this is a technology meeting. So here are some of the, the more exciting technologies that we're working with in the Federal Highway Administration. Uh, the upper left is ultra high performance concrete. And I saw there was at least one of the posters out there had, uh, had a project with that. And our Dr. Ben Graybeal at our Turner Fairbank Research Center is, I think he's kind of the number one guru in the world with this stuff, with the UHPC. Uh, next to that is the TFAST test, which is uh, one of the newer cutting edge alkali silica reactivity tests that was developed uh, and kind of invented at our Turner Fairbank lab. Then the lower left is a super air meter. Looks a whole lot like a type B pressure pot, but it doesn't just measure total air content like a type B does. It actually gives you an indication of, of the type of air system you have. So do you have a lot of really small bubbles that you want or a few big bubbles that you don't want? So it, and it really does a very good job at identifying high performing versus low performing admixtures. Uh, on the bottom right is the surface resistivity test. And I have that list as kind of an emerging technology. We've got about a dozen states in the country now that are using it. Main DOT, and I think Ken may have been chief engineer when this happened, but uh, Main DOT was either the second or third state in the country to implement this test, and has been one of the real national leaders at providing some data and experience and helping other states go in this direction. We in Federal Highways are working with about 25 other states now that are putting this test into their specs. And then the top right is called the Phoenix. That was developed by Dr. Tyler Lay at Oklahoma State University, and that is a, a very simple device, but, it, but it's a, uh, a device to measure fresh uh, water content in concrete. So those are things, that, again, we're working with in the program. Interesting technologies. It is a very good time to be working in the concrete arena because our research community has really delivered over the last decade and given us a number of these kind of tools that we can now take some steps forward. But I want to talk now the rest of my talk about revisiting some of the basics and why do we do what we do with concrete and how do we manage to keep screwing it up all this many decades later. All right, 56 day testing. That's one of the things we're promoting. Um, why do we test concrete at 28 days in our specs and in all of our national standards? And Eric, you can't answer. But the reason is that's based on the strength gain for Portland cement. Right, and that's the primary ingredient. That's where we get the strength from in our concrete. And that's great, except starting in the 80s, we started to take out anywhere from 20 to 50% of that material and replace it with other good materials. I mean, we, we get the, the ASR protection and the durability protection that a lot of these supplementary materials give us, but every single one of these materials takes longer to develop their strength. And why are we so hung up on strength? We're so hung up on strength because for decades, we haven't had a good durability test, right? People of my vintage, we were all taught in school. First thing you learn is high strength concrete is good concrete, is good performing concrete. If you have a 4,000 PSI requirement on your abutment and you get a 6,000 uh, concrete that you break, you're 50% more durable. BS, we have learned now that is absolutely not true. Strength tells us one thing, the ability of the concrete to carry a load, period. We've got to get out of this mindset that strength is some sort of surrogate indicator of concrete durability. It is not. And I would dare say most higher strength concretes these days are less durable. I would way rather have 4,000 PSI than six. And we'll touch on that in a minute. But here's the data. I told you I've got data to back my statements up. If you look at this data, the horizontal red lines are the specification limits in those states. And you can see the 7, 28, and 56 day strengths. And as we move into this low carbon future, and Federal Highways is promoting our low carbon materials program now, there's not a chief engineer in the country that wouldn't foam at the mouth if I could walk up to him today and say, tomorrow you can have 15% more sustainable concrete. And you don't have to change a material. You don't have to change your construction practices. You don't have to change anything your contractors are doing. Because look at this. I said, you know, in the 80s, we started to put supplementary materials in and take out cement. But we didn't change the time frame that we're testing. So what, what do we get out of that? And we've told the contractors, and I'm going to jump ahead just a second. You know, we, we test concrete for all kinds of things. 
But if there is one universal truism in the world of concrete, it is if you don't get F prime C at 28 days, somebody's taking it in the wallet, right? And so industry has reacted to that. They don't take that risk. So we don't see, I'm working with a state now, not too far from here, that has 4,000 PSI spec. If you, you can have a 30% class F fly ash mix that breaks at 3950 at 28 days and you get a 50% penalty. And that state routinely gets 8,000 PSI on their projects. Their contractors aren't gonna take that risk, right? So we write bad specs and then we have the audacity to say that we wanna provide sustainable concrete. If we wanna provide sustainable concrete, we'll change our specs to do it. And, and they, uh, when I say the 10 to 15% that you can have tomorrow, to change your acceptance spec from 28 to 56 days, which is the right time for today's mix, because we need time for all these supplementary materials to gain the strength, right? But this is the difference, this difference from pink to green, that's gonna evaporate. As soon as your contractors realize they're not at the risk for that, that differential strength in that time frame. As soon as they know they can take advantage of that, these numbers are gonna drop. And that means less cement. So when we start talking, you know, we need more sustainable, more viable stuff. It's not all about new materials. It's not all about EPDs. This is just concrete basics where our predecessors in the eighties let us down. They didn't make this change and they damn well should have because we are stuck living with the remnants of it. And again, you can see it right there. Everything above those red lines is wasted cement. And that's the reality. This is, uh, again, you can see how many different states are involved. This is everywhere. All right, it's the wrong time. The great 28, it's the wrong time for today's mixes. It just doesn't fit. And what are the implications? Cost. We are forcing our contractors to put more cement in, which is the most expensive ingredient. Durability, again, how does concrete deteriorate today? We figured out ASR and we figured out decracking. So aggregate related problems are largely gone. Concrete fails in the paste. And that's where it's gonna fail in the future. And by writing a spec the way we write it and by sticking with this 28 day idea, we're forcing our contractors to put more paste in. So we have more potential to deteriorate in the future and debt cracking. Every few years, Ashto surveys the state bridge engineers and asks them what performance problems they're having with concrete. Every single survey they've done, the number one response has been concrete bridge deck cracking. And, you know, and, and as you probably all know, tons of research done about this, all kinds of ways we gotta figure out what's making this concrete crack. A lot of it is as simple as this. We force our contractors to give us crack prone mixes because of how we're gonna enforce specifications on them. Right? And this idea is catching on now. Texas is the number one concrete producing state in the country. Florida is number three. New York is number nine. All three of those states within the past two years have now gone to accepting concrete at 56 days. And I'll let the cat out of the bag a little bit early. California is the number two concrete producing state. I was talking with their concrete engineer at a meeting about a month ago. And when they issue their next spec this September or October, it is going to 56 days as well. So this is a concept that is catching on because it has to, and it really has to. If we wanna start looking at low carbon materials and how these are gonna impact our future with concrete, we gotta get it right with the material we have today. We gotta to assess today's stuff correctly before we try to figure out the impact of new materials. And the nice thing, the resistivity test, which if I could only test concrete for one thing, it would be that surface resistivity test. 56 days is the right time for that test as well. The graph on the left is field data from our trailer project. The graph on the right is some uh, mixes that were done as part of a research project at Turner Fairbank. And the point on this slide is to look at the difference in the slopes of those lines from 28 to 56 days. You know, a lot of states, when they bring this test in, they want to try to stick with their 28-day testing regime. And you can't do that with this. You can't project ahead to what you're going to get at 56 days because the, the change that you see in the slope of those lines is the effect of your SCMs. <clears throat> and that's gonna be different in every mix. So the 56 days, as states are moving more and more to this resistivity test, which is the concrete durability test that we've needed for decades, as states move to that, they're finding 56 days is the right time for that test, and it makes it easier then to, to make the switch with strength as well. Percent within limits for strength. Quick show of hands, how many people are familiar with percent within limits at all? 
Ken, I knew you would be. <laughs> just a couple. Okay, I'm going to give you the two-second explanation. Just like your seventh grade social studies test, or if any of you went to Clarkson, our freshman physics final, it's graded by a bell curve. Well, decades of research have shown that project-produced materials, whether it's concrete, asphalt, soils, and aggregates, they vary by a bell curve. <clears throat> right? So what we want to encourage our contractors to be consistent. Right? I went to a TRB session on quality assurance last year. Rick Bradbury from Maine DOT was the lead speaker, and he opened his talk by saying, we can't have quality without consistency. Well, what do we do in our specs to tell our contractors we want consistent concrete? In 38 states, we don't do a thing. In 12 states, they use this kind of approach. But 38 states don't do a thing. And I'll show you what the impact of that, what the data shows in just a minute. Right? We tried it in Maine. And we actually, the first project we tried it on was the design build job in Bath many years ago. And it had a very short life in Maine. It didn't work for us at the time. And, and I actually, if you had had me here five years ago, I would have been arguing against this till the cows come home because of our negative experience here with Maine DOT. And, and it just didn't work. We couldn't make it work in a spec. I have since learned, I think we just gave up too early in the, in the learning curve because it does work and the data will show it. This is Michigan, which again, we thought of all the states in the country, Michigan had the best spec that promotes consistency and the way they apply PWL and the standards in their spec. And again, this is all actual data from our trailer visit. You can see their bell curve, very tall, skinny bell curve. That is really consistent concrete. Compare that to a couple other states and the 28 designator on here, that just means it's 28 day testing. You can see here, we've got Arizona and Washington, I think. Again, pretty reasonable results as well. Not quite as good as Michigan, but fairly tight bell curves. And, and these are all states that require this PWL. That's how they pay for their concrete versus the states that have a different method that don't require PWL. Right? That is a lot of variability. And I think the real insight on this, this graph is this graph on the right. If you look here, this state and Michigan are both designing their mixes so nothing breaks under 4,000. Right? But to do that in Michigan, you got to aim for 4,300. To do it in this state, you got to aim at 6,300. That's 2,000 PSI worth of cement they don't need. Because that contractor has just decided to hell with consistency and quality control. I can just throw some extra cement at it because all this state cares about is if I meet F prime C at 28 days. They don't care about consistency. And again, that's 38 states in the country. I just picked two that we had some data from, but that we see this everywhere with our field work. And that kind of goes hand in hand with this idea of specifying quality control. And again, an area where Maine DOT was one of the leaders nationally. There's only 15 states in the country that have the words quality control in their specification. For years, the attitude has been quality control. That's contractor's problem. That's their deal to fix. And I've never understood that mindset because how is it to the taxpayer or the agency's detriment to help the person producing your product produce a better product for you. So I've, I've never understood this idea of that we need to stay totally out of the contractor's hair. What we need to do is what we've done now, and this document's been out for about 18 months. And what this document does is set the bar for what should quality control be and how should agencies deal with it in specifications for infrastructure projects. I will plead with you, particularly since I'm in Maine, one of the three states in the country that does not have a concrete paving spec, <clears throat> I will plead with you to ignore this word paving in the title. But the reason it's in there, there's only two parts of that book that apply to paving and only paving. There's two tests, one called a V. Kelly and one called a box test that are strictly slip form paving tests. Everything else in this book pertains to all concrete. Uh, and the reason paving is in the title is the money that went to develop that thing came from a paving earmark. So we had to put the word paving in there somewhere. That's why it's in there. Concrete's concrete. And again, all of this is in here. We chant, we didn't want this to be a uh, something from the feds or even state agencies because this had to resonate with industry as well. So the, the team that wrote this was a professor from UNC Charlotte, along with a 30 year concrete contractor and a 40 year guy who worked in the cement industry and still does some consulting for him. So they come out with this time. I encourage you to take a look at it. It's available for free on the uh, National Concrete Pavement Technology Center uh, website. And the link is there. Uh, take a look at it. It's written in four sections. It's 150 plus pages long. So you're not going to read it all in one setting. But it is, we challenge the team to give us something that agencies can figure out how to leverage QC in their specs. 
that a really good, highly integrated uh, contractor can use this to assess their program or improve it, or your mom and pop with basically nothing for a program can build something from this. And where I knew we hit the home run, this was the team that we had help us review the document. You can see Rick's name on there from MainDOT. So some really knowledgeable folks from around the country. But where I knew we hit the home run with this thing and did what we were trying to do, it's, it's right here. These contractors, they were nominated by their states to be reviewers for this because the contractors did excellent work and these individuals, or the QC managers, were recognized in their industry. So this guy, Jonathan, do it construction. They're out in Oklahoma. And we had the trailer on a project there last year. <clears throat> and I never met John. So when we're on the project there, I made a point to, you know, go introduce myself to him and thank him for the time and effort he put into this. He said, Mike, this is the best concrete book I've ever read. And it, it sits on my desk and I refer to it several times a day. Or, I'm sorry, several times a week. Again, this is a guy known, you know, a good quality company with a guy who knows what he's doing. Well, the Oklahoma concrete engineer was standing about 10 or 15 feet away. He goes, hang on a second, guys. And he goes down the hallway to his office. He goes back and he's got his man. He says, it sits on my desk too when I look at it several times a week. That's when I knew we hit a home run with this thing is when it makes sense for the industry and the agency in the same state. And they're both using it to make okay. right good concrete efforts and decisions. Now, I highly encourage you to read it. If you're not interested in digging into the whole book, we are just about to publish four tech briefs, which are five to six page, you know, reader's digest versions of each section. So take a look at the CP Tech website and, uh, and take a look at this document. And with that, I hope you will all rush out and change your concrete specs to 56 day testing, uh, along with a few other things to have a modern concrete spec for modern concrete. And if anybody's interested in one, we just uh, developed a federal highway, what we call a model durability spec that incorporates a lot of the new technologies and, and approaches that I've talked about here. We, we offer it to states and, and have shared it with probably 20 states by now. Uh, we'll offer that directly. We have also, uh, it was balloted yesterday and we, we hired a couple of folks to take what we wrote as a federal highway spec, convert it to AASHTO format. It was just balloted and passed through AASHTO yesterday. So AASHTO will be having their AASHTO version of a, of a new concrete durability document published very shortly. And now I'm done.